For decades, one company, EMD, ruled American freight, fielding over 3,900 SDU-42 locomotives and controlling nearly 70% of the market. Their dominance seemed absolute, but when railroads demanded more power and traction in the 1990s, a groundbreaking machine arrived. What secret weakness could shatter an empire built on reliability? To understand why, why EMD's empire unraveled, we have to look inside the world they once owned. Across the American heartland, the SD-42 became as familiar as the grain it hauled and the coal it pulled from the earth. Railroads from Burlington Northern to Union Pacific built their operations around these locomotives, trusting them to move freight day and night, year after year. With nearly 3,900 units built, the SD-4.2 was not just a workhorse, it was the backbone of an entire industry. Every major railroad rostered hundreds, sometimes thousands, of these six-axle, 3,000-horsepower machines. Standardization brought a quiet kind of power. Parts were interchangeable, crews could move between railroads with confidence, and maintenance was streamlined. When a train needed more muscle, dispatchers simply coupled another SD-42 to the consist. It was common to see five, six, even eight of these engines lashed together, stretching for hundreds of feet at the head of a mile-long train. Reliability was not just a slogan, it was a lived reality. The SD-4B2's direct current traction system was simple, rugged, and proven in every kind of weather. Railroads kept them running through blizzards in Minnesota, summer heat in Texas, and the relentless pounding of coal drags on steep Appalachian grades. For decades, if you were moving heavy freight in North America, the SD-42 was the gold standard. It was an icon that defined what it meant to be dependable. This was not just a locomotive, it was a fortress on wheels, trusted by generations of railroaders. Any challenger would have to do more than promise new technology. It would have to unseat a legend that, for a time, seemed unbreakable. Wheel slip wasn't just a technical nuisance, it was a drain on every railroad's bottom line. As trains grew heavier in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the old direct current traction systems started to show their limits. Each SD4E2 relied on mechanical commutators and carbon brushes to transfer power to the wheels. When a heavy coal train crawled up a grade in the rain, it only took one axle to lose grip for the entire system to react. The control logic would instantly cut back power across all six motors, not just the one in trouble. That meant a single patch of wet rail could rob an entire locomotive of its pulling force. Every slip event cost real money. Instead of using all the available horsepower, the locomotive ran at a fraction of its potential. Fuel burned, but the train slowed. Wheels spun against the rail, grinding away steel and leaving maintenance crews with more work. Over time, wheel sets wore out faster and the cost of replacements climbed. Shop workers learned to dread the aftermath of a big storm or a long season of heavy drags. More wheel turning, more commutator repairs, more unscheduled downtime. Railroads coped by adding more locomotives to each train, hoping that sheer numbers could overcome the physics. But that just meant more engines burning more fuel, each one fighting the same battle against slip. The economics were brutal, Every lost pound of tractive effort translated into wasted diesel, higher maintenance bills, and longer train times. In the world of direct current traction, wheel slip wasn't just a technical flaw. It was an unavoidable expense, baked into the cost of moving freight across a continent. The AC4400CW rewrote the playbook for how a locomotive could grip the rails. At the heart of the change was a shift from brute force to precision. Six AC traction motors, each fed by its own GTO-based inverter, were managed by a microprocessor that watched every axle in real time. Instead of relying on brushes and commutators, the AC system used solid-state electronics to deliver exactly the right amount of power to each wheel. When a patch of wet rail threatened traction, the computer cut torque to just that axle, letting the other five keep pulling at full strength. This was a world away from the old DC logic, where a single slip meant power was cut across the board. Suddenly, more of the locomotive's 4,400 horsepower could be used to move the train, not wasted in wheel spin or lost as heat. 
The numbers tell the story. The AC4400CW could sustain about 145,000 pounds of continuous tractive effort at low speed, roughly 70% more than the 83,000 pounds typical of the SD42. In heavy drag service, that meant one AC unit could often replace two DC locomotives, especially on steep grades or in poor weather. Railroads that once relied on long lash-ups found they could run the same tonnage with half as many engines, cutting fuel, crew complexity, and maintenance hours. But the innovation did not stop at the wheels. The AC4400CW's GE7FDL16 engine brought four-stroke efficiency to the table, running cleaner and going longer between overhauls than EMD's two-stroke designs. Inspection intervals stretched out to 92 days, and fuel economy improved in the kind of high-load work that punished older fleets. The combination of smart adhesion, robust electronics, and a more efficient engine made the AC4400CW a locomotive that did not just pull harder, it pulled smarter, setting a new standard for what railroads expected from their power. CSX did not just buy into the AS4400DRCW on a hunch. They put the new power to work in the heart of their coal network, where every mile meant pounding rails and punishing grades. What stood out in the maintenance shops was not just the raw pulling force, but the way the numbers changed at the end of the month. Reports from CSX's heavy haul divisions tracked a sharp drop in wheel replacements and unscheduled shop visits. With AC traction, the constant grind of wheel slip faded into the background. Wheels lasted longer, crews spent less time swapping out worn steel, and the company's maintenance budget finally caught a break after years of steady increases. Canadian Pacific put the ACV 400 Jipar and CW to the test on the steepest climbs in the Rockies. Rogers Pass, with its 2.2% grades and unpredictable weather, had a reputation for stalling trains and stranding tonnage. Canadian Pacific's mechanical teams watched closely as the new AC locomotives took charge of loaded grain and coal drags. The difference became clear on the worst days. Where DC fleets struggled for grip, the AC locomotives kept trains moving, even through snow and ice. Stall delays, once a routine headache, became rare exceptions. Dispatchers could plan longer trains with fewer locomotives, confident that the power would hold the line all the way to the summit. Union Pacific's experience played out on the broad, open curves of the Powder River Basin. Here, the fuel bill for a single coal train could run into five figures. When AC4400 Bosch CW locomotives replaced older DC consists, fuel consumption per ton mile dropped. Internal analyses pointed to high single-digit savings, sometimes reaching double digits on the heaviest runs. Over the course of a year, those numbers added up to millions saved. Fewer locomotives per train, less wasted energy and wheel slip, and longer intervals between shop visits were the metrics that convinced the industry this was not just a new locomotive, it was a new way to run a railroad. Savings changed the balance sheet. EMD's answer to the AC revolution was the SD90M Mac, a locomotive built around a gamble that never paid off. The strategy hinged on a brand new engine, the 16-cylinder 265H, designed for an ambitious 6,000 horsepower. But the 265H was plagued by reliability problems from the start. Crankcase cracks, turbocharger failures, and vibration issues sent early production units back to the shop again and again. EMD tried to buy time with a so-called convertible approach, selling hundreds of SD90 Max powered by the older 710 engine, promising they could be upgraded to the 265H later. Not a single one was ever converted. Railroads watched as the H-powered units spent more time sidelined than hauling freight. By the early 2000s, every North American SD90 Mac with a 265H engine had either been repowered or scrapped. The promise of a technological leap turned into a cautionary tale, one that cost EMD the confidence of its biggest customers. By the end of the 1990s, the scoreboard looked nothing like it had a decade before. General Electric's AC4400 Dissolved CW didn't just find a market, it dominated it. Across North America, nearly 3,000 of these locomotives rolled out of Erie, filling order books from CSX, Union Pacific, and Canadian Pacific. In that same window, 
EMD's share of new locomotive orders collapsed to around 30%, a far cry from its post-war dominance. The surge in AC4400D CW production kept General Electric's factories busy, while EMD's plants faced layoffs and shrinking backlogs. For the first time in generations, the industry's center of gravity shifted. The numbers told the story. General Electric was now the builder that set the pace, and the AT3400 Thun CW was the machine that powered the market's new reality. Today, nearly 3,000 AC4400 C CDBBUs still pull freight across North America, a testament to how one technological leap can upend an entire industry. As railroads chase automation and ever greater efficiency, the lesson endures. Innovation rewrites the rules, and nothing in engineering dominance is ever permanent. Thanks for watching.